these excerpts are like you know, 30 seconds. Okay, some things for sure to expect on the test. Be able to fill out the chart that is on page 229 comparing classical and romantic characteristics. 
So be sure that you can use the terminology appropriately and that you study that chart because that will be on the test for sure. Also something that will be on the test is to diagram Sonata Allegro. So be sure you study that. And then be prepared to write about um, classicism in the arts. So read that in the text. And also review your notes. Relationships of the Enlightenment and Viennese classicism. So you'll have some things in your notes about that. And then also romanticism in music. What are some typical themes? And what does romantic music have to do with? So you might make a list of as many characteristics of romanticism as you can come up with. I gave you a whole bunch of different things, so just look over that, okay? Because I'll have something having to do with romantic characteristics um, and how these are reflected in, in the music of the 19th century. Be sure that you've read all of the biographical information about the five composers that are covered. I'll ask some questions that are taken from that reading in the text. Then you should be prepared to just make some statements about the symphony. So what do you expect um, from a Viennese classical symphony as far as the orchestration? So you should be able to describe the orchestration. You should be able to describe typically what you would find as far as number of movements, the tempos, the keys, the forms associated. So if I asked you a question like, what form would you expect um, in a typical third movement of a Haydn symphony? You would typically say, minuet and trio is the form or first movement would be Sonata Allegro form. Then you want to be able to just make some general statements about how orchestration changed in the 19th century. So the general thing that was happening was that they were increasing the size of the orchestra, which then yielded greater possibility of color contrast. All right, then with each composer that we talked about, there were a few main points that, that I brought up. So with Mozart, some of the, if, if you haven't already looked at the, uh, the review questions, be sure that you <coughs> use these as a study guide and that you can talk about all of these different um, elements. So with Mozart, identify the, uh, the two genres that he um, is credited with having written some of his greatest compositions are opera and concerto. So we're going to look at a concerto in the next section. But Mozart's music exhibits characteristics of both Italian and German composers. His style, as he grew up, was based primarily on the Italian style. So it's a vocal, lyrical approach to writing music. It is using homophonic textures which is very Italian, closed phrasing, and just the concept of music as entertainment, something that delights and pleases the listener. Of course, his music is much more than that, 
but these are general concepts that appeared during the 18th century, the first half of the 18th century, and which then led to the classical style of, of uh, Vini's composers. So later in his career, then he developed um, a little more um, complicated contrapuntal writing um, and the idea of music as abstract expression is something that's more German. So the Italians wrote more opera, which had texts, not so much in Germany. They did, of course, pick up opera, but um, initially that was more of an Italian thing. And that music was viewed as something that was a you know, profound, learned expression. So be able to talk about Italian, German characteristics in Mozart's music. And then you want to study the way that Mozart approaches the development of his themes in the first movement, and you should know the term motivic thematic development. So to review, Mozart extracted three motives from the opening section, the opening tonic section in the exposition, and used those three motives in the movement, but especially in the development section, he combined those in a polyphonic texture. And so we talked about the term canonic, what that means. There's one point in the development section where all three motives are sounding at the same time. So um, it really shows um, some of the greatest, one of the greatest examples of Mozart's sort of skill as a composer. And we talked about the function of a introduction in a work like this. And so both the Mozart Prague Symphony and the Haydn London Symphony had adagio introductions. So they serve as a dramatic contrast to the Allegro um, tempo when the exposition begins. Also, there was a contrast of mode. But that's the main idea. It's just a you know, dramatic contrast. So in the second movement of the Prague Symphony of Mozart, then Mozart doesn't have as complicated a development section. It's more typical of his earlier style which is more sequential and just, you know, traveling through some closely related keys, but um, not having a, a real dense contrapuntal development looking at themes. So that technique of motivic thematic development is something that was a Haydn characteristic that influenced Mozart. Mozart's use of a very lyrical, expressive, melodic chromaticism is something that you want to associate with his style. So melodic chromaticism. And that's something that influenced Haydn. So they both had elements that influenced, influenced each other. So the Mozart Prague Symphony had a couple of unusual features in that it didn't have a minuet and trio movement, and it wasn't scored for clarinets. The Haydn London Symphony, on the other hand, was very typical. So it's a four movement work with the typical forms and tempos and keys, and typical orchestration. So it calls for all four of the wind instruments that you expect. And this first movement is a movement that is very representative of Haydn's use of motivic thematic development. And we talked about the term monothematicism in connection with this first movement. And so instead of giving a contrasting lyrical B theme, 
when it has modulated the cadence in the second key, in the dominant key, Haydn just restates the A theme. And so if I ask you to describe that monothematicism, of course you could say it's using one theme, but describe it within the context of this example, which uses that term within a simple <coughs> form. Be prepared to talk about the way that Haydn builds that sense of excitement to the very end of the retransition before the A theme is restated at the recap. So what are some things that Haydn does to build that excitement and the tension there? All right, but, but yes. Changes. Yeah, there were like five things that, that uh, we talked about there. So it had a rising pitch level. It had the loudest dynamics. You had the full orchestra. It had a prolongation of the dominant harmony. You just stayed on that dominant harmony as the, as the line then ascended. You had chromaticism that was used. You had the shortest subdivision of the beat which gave it the most activity, you know, rhythmically. But maybe the biggest dramatic element was the silence before the recap, that dramatic grand pause. <clears throat> All right, so with Beethoven, we see the bridge between classical Classicism and Romanticism. So Beethoven is firmly rooted in the classical tradition. And so form is a very important aspect of his, of his works. So there's always a sense of logic. And he's concerned with um, you know, that sense of proportion and, um, and balance and those, those types of elements. But Beethoven's music has a much greater sense of personal expression, individual expression. And so we see with his middle period works and on that he exhibits this urgent need to communicate and it has to do partly with the, the personal affliction of losing its hearing. You should know what the Heiligenstadt Testament is, be able to talk about some of the basic themes in that letter that he wrote to his brothers. You should know some things that, that Beethoven introduced with the symphony, and so, he wrote symphonies that were longer, that were more complex. He wrote symphonies that started to call for extra instruments. So the fifth symphony that we looked at, the last movement of that work, calls for three new instruments, for piccolo, for trombones, and for contrabassoon. And so Beethoven writes scherzo movements instead of many way trio movements. You should be able to describe the difference between a scherzo trio and a minuet in trio. And then you should be able to describe the general expectations of a scherzo trio in, you know, just as far as what's going to happen. So the trio section would provide a sense of contrast so specifically in the Fifth Symphony, Beethoven's Scherzo trio movement has the Scherzo that's in C minor, 